Outline uh, tonight, and this is our first uh, study of a new series of lessons that will probably be about uh, 12 or 13 weeks, about three months, all of May, all of June, and probably all of July on our Wednesday evening uh, Bible study. This is one that uh, I announced several months ago. I even told the men last year or in December uh, about it, and uh, they were excited about this one, and it's front and back. Has everybody got one? I might need one. Maybe I'll play. And uh, you can add this to a little notebook if you want to, or you can uh, um, uh, put it in your Bible. And um, But this is uh, a study, and I'll be the first to tell you that I do not hold all the answers. There's been some questions that people have asked and I have had to say, I don't know. But there are enough answers within the scripture to let us know that this is a good biblical study. And there may be things that you take from this that you did not know uh, before. And uh, so uh, we're looking at uh, this uh, series of uh, where are uh, the dead? Is there life uh, after death? And tonight is the first lesson which deals with the value of such a, uh, a study. And if you would, go to Job chapter 14, verse 14, and on down, when we get into the back page of your outline, or near the end of the bottom of the first page, there'll be things that you can fill in, and there'll be verses of Scripture that you can write down that we will turn to and look up uh, and read. But one of the things... And I didn't really start uh, studying this until uh, I was about midway uh, in uh, ministry uh, at, uh, at Eastside. And we did a special in-depth study on this at Mount Carmel. When I was up there, we took one month uh, where we just did a month study. And it was probably about an hour and a half, two hours long on Wednesday night. But that was okay because they had a meal. Uh, they prepared supper uh, beforehand, and we had like good old-fashioned food like soup beans and cornbread. And we had chicken and dumplings and, and uh, country ham. And, banana pudding. Hmm? Banana pudding. Uh, no, I didn't have banana pudding back then. <laughs> I didn't know anything about banana pudding. And uh, so, but, uh, and I haven't had any banana pudding. So we may be here all night. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. Remember, you have 29 minutes. I got 29 minutes. We can always record over it. So, But um, I did an in-depth study on it, and they really enjoyed it. And uh, we did some other special in-depth uh, studies uh, when I was up there. Uh, but this tonight, we have to go back to the time of, of Abraham. Okay, Abraham was around 2000 B.C., okay? And we are now in 2022, so it's been over 4,000 years since Abraham lived upon this earth, okay? But also, when you turn to the book of Job, Job was a contemporary of Abraham. That means that he lived in the same era, the same time that Abraham did. Okay, and so notice the question that's been on the minds of people for over 4,000 years. And we find it there in verse 14 of chapter 14 of Job. He says, if a man dies, shall he live again? Okay, that was a pertinent question that was hanging on Job's mind over 4,000 years ago. And I think that hangs on our minds tonight. And I think that all of us here would agree that yes, that that person lives again. And we think of it in the future sense as far as they're in heaven. But what about right now? Where are they? Are they in heaven? Are they in paradise? Where are they? And so we're going to talk about that in the weeks 
to come because the scripture tells us and shows us what happens to the soul, to the spirit, okay? And also it tells us what happens to the body uh, as well. But the thing about the body, it's temporal anyway, okay? It doesn't last forever. But the soul and spirit, it does, okay? And so this study is a very fascinating study. There's been a lot of books written about it. A lot of lectures have been given about this subject. But also, there have been some negative things that have come as a result of it. And one of them I put here is the interest in the occult. Does anybody know what the occult is? Seances. Satan worship having to do with uh, say, satanic things. That's the occult. Uh, there are Satan worshipers today uh, in, in the world, uh, just as there are those that worship Jesus Christ. But one of the things that probably my generation will remember the most is that our friends would get together and have a sleepover or have uh, all the boys come over to Joe's house and and bring their sleeping bags, but before we went to bed, they'd get out what was called a Ouija board, okay? And they would mess with that Ouija board. And often, sometimes they said that thing moved without them even pushing it and guiding it around. And you have a lot of things that are uh, satanic that comes uh, from the form of, of evil. Uh, you have uh, your horoscope, uh, reading that, believing in that. Also, there's such things as reading your palm and also uh, trying to talk to those that are deceased and uh, to communicate with them. And there's people that are hooked on that. And they'll go to see uh, somebody and want to look through a, a crystal ball and, and to tell their future and to tell what their loved one is doing or what their loved one would say to them. And so it's an interest in the occult, but Satan always takes something that's good and he does what? He twists it, doesn't he? And he always makes it be that which is not pure. Okay? And there's a lot of also speculation out there today concerning the timing and the events of the return of Christ, which falls into this uh, as well. And it's created so much confusion among those who are Christians who have every reason to look forward to the future with certainty and also with great uh, expectation. Uh, though the Bible has much to say about what will occur after death and also in the future, many have not studied the Bible carefully. They've just heard things that have heard from their friends. They've heard it from a renowned speaker or read in a book, a very popular series uh, that may be out or read in a periodical. And taking these things at face value, they formulate it and say, well, this is the way that it is. When the truth of the matter, it may be just the opposite. It may not be a doctrine that's found in scripture. It may be a man-made doctrine. So what I want to do in this study is to look to see what the scripture uh, says and to give you these scriptures that you can write down in the outline that you can look back uh, in, uh, in the future as a reference point. And uh, so my prayer is that as we go through this series of lessons on where are the dead is their life after death, that it may help increase our understanding on what the Bible itself actually teaches and may help to define some, some terms that are associated uh, with, uh, this, uh, with this study, okay? And that's where we get to the definition of terms tonight, and I've given you some here. And the first one is eschatology. Boy, that's a $55,000 word, isn't it? Eschatology. Okay, and I've given you the definition there out from it. Eschatology is the systematic study 
of that which the Bible has revealed regarding the future, what's going to happen to us after we die in our future state, because like I said, the body is just a temporal thing, just a tent, and it goes back to the dust from where it came, but the soul and spirit lives on forever. And that's the term that is called eschatology. And it comes from two Greek words. Eschatos, meaning last things. And then logos, meaning word or discourse. So therefore, eschatology is a discourse about the last things. And... One of the things that we see about eschatology that it can be divided up into two general areas. Okay, and I've given you these. The first one is individual eschatology. Pertains to what happens to the individual between death and the final return of Christ. Because there's been a lot that's been taught about that. Some say there is soul sleeping. But what is soul sleeping? Do we find that in the Bible to support that? There's also purgatory that was taught in church history where you could go and get penance, you could repent, and that you could be restored if you lived a sinful life. There's also those in church history that they were told if they sold their houses and lands and brought the money and paid it to the church that they would go in and pray for their loved one to, to be there in heaven with Jesus. And so it was a play upon sympathy and, and struggling people at that time. But that's what was taught. We're going to see is that biblical or not. And there is the state uh, between uh, this life and eternal life there in heaven. It's, it's known as the intermediate state. And there's one whole lesson where we're going to talk about that, that what happens when the soul leaves the body. We know where the body goes, but where does the soul go? And we're going to look at that uh, in Scripture. And then there's the general eschatology. It pertains to what will happen when and after Christ comes. And I'll say this tonight, and the Scripture supports this, that Christ is only going to come back one more time. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. He came the first time, to give us salvation, but then he's going to come back the second time to redeem those that have come to him and received that salvation. And there's some that teach that Jesus is going to what? Sneak in and sneak out. Take some with him. Sneak in and sneak out. But the scripture says that all will see him and all will hear the second coming of Christ. And so we'll get to that when we talk about that general eschatology. So tonight what I want us to do is to see the value of such a study this evening. I've given you uh, seven plus conclusion that we look up a couple of uh, verses and then we'll get into that individual uh, eschatology talking about what happens between death and the return of Christ and about the intermediate uh, state. But tonight, we see first of all that the value of such a study is this, that it encourages us to so live that the blessings will be ours. Again, it encourages us to so live that the blessings will be ours. The Lord has promised wonderful blessings to those who will endure. Look, if you would, in James chapter 1, verse 12 tonight. You might want to jot that down on that outline and maybe even be upon the PowerPoint tonight. James 1, 12. I'm reading from the New King James. James 1, 12. It says, Blessed, and that word means happy. Happy is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love Him. That's something we have to look forward to as Christians tonight, isn't it? That we have the hope and the blessed assurance of eternal life where? Where? In heaven, isn't it? In heaven. Where Jesus is. Where God the Father 
where he is and where the angels are and also the Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints and those that have died being faithful to the Lord. Again, look at that verse. Blessed is the man, you also say woman there too, who endures temptation. Haven't we been tempted today? Oh, yes. Sure. Satan has tempted us. May have been tempted not to come to church tonight. May have been tempted not to read your chapter uh, for today. Might have been tempted not to invite someone uh, to church. Might have been tempted to lie. Uh, you know, there's all types of temptations that are out there. And so when you endure and you uh, overcome those temptations, that you have been uh, approved. And that when you're prudent, you'll receive that crown of life which the Lord has promised. Does the Lord ever go back on His promise? No. On any promise? When we see the rainbow, what is that promise telling us? There's not going to be another worldwide flood, is there? Do you believe that? I do. There hasn't been a worldwide flood since the one that happened back in the days of, of Noah. And there's not going to be. God's not going to destroy the world again with water. But is the world going to be destroyed? By fire. By fire, isn't it? And it's fervent heat, as Peter talks about, that everything is going to be burned up. That all this material possessions is just going to go up into flames. This earth is not going to exist. There's going to be, a, as the Bible says, a new heaven and a new earth. And my take on that is that when we are in heaven, there's going to be similarities of things that look like what they did down here on earth. Remember it talks about a river? Wasn't a river down here on earth? It, and also trees be there, streets of gold, walls of, of jasper. And so there's going to be certain things there in heaven that's going to resemble the earth, but it's not going to be the earth, though, is it? Because the earth is going to be destroyed. It's going to just go back to nothing. Okay? And so that encourages us to endure to go to a place that's going to be for eternity. It is entirely proper for the Christian to seek whatever blessings God has prepared for the righteous. Look, if you would, at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 8 and going down to verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. Peter wrote, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing." Knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit what? A blessing. A blessing. And then he quotes back from the Old uh, Testament uh, Scripture uh, here, as we see in uh, verse 10 of, of uh, chapter 3, and it goes back to Psalms. Psalms 34, verses 12 through 16. But he says, He who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Can anybody tell me the song that we sang tonight that kind of talked about that? You remember the song that we sang that talked about how that those live in the wrong every day don't seem to get punished, but we try to live right, it seems like things are, hmm? Father and long. Somebody get that verse. Go back to that hymn. Is it the first verse, Tony, or the second verse that has that uh, second, second verse. Somebody go to uh, Father Long and, and read that second verse. Uh, 
I thought about that when we were singing it because when death is coming, taking our loved ones, leaves our home so lonely and drear. No, no. Then do we wonder why others prosper? Oh. Living so wicked year after year. Right. Okay, look at that last part there about the. Uh, okay. Then do we wonder why others prosper? Living so wicked year after year. Right. That kind of seems the way things are going, isn't it? You know, if you and I did some of the things that other people did, we'd be severely punished, wouldn't we? But some people can do things and they get a little smack on the wrist or, or just go away. And some of it has to do with what? Money. Money, and money isn't it? Money and politics and power. We don't have money. We don't have power. We don't have politics. But all we've got is good looks, isn't it? But you can't pay a down payment on the house with good looks, can you? Okay. Especially when you got socked in the job. Especially when you got socked in the job, you can't you can't pay a down payment on the house. So, but the thing about it is, the record's going to be set straight when Christ comes back. It that those that have done wrong year after year and have gotten by with it, they're going to face their Creator and Sustainer of life. And then it's going to be too late for them. But as we go through life, we have many hardships, difficulties, setbacks. But we don't throw in the towel and quit, do we? We keep moving forward. We keep one foot in front of the other. We keep on keeping on. You don't retire from being a Christian down here on earth. You live your Christian life every day. You let your life shine every day. So it encourages us to so live that the blessings will be ours. Secondly, we see that it furnishes a stimulus and a theme for evangelism. And we know of what's laying ahead of us, and Paul was so much wanting to preach that to the sinful people. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 and 11. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 and 11. <coughs> and this motivated Paul to preach because he didn't want anyone to, to go to hell. He told the elders when he met with them at Miletus on his way to Rome, he says, I am innocent of the blood of all men. That means that everybody he came in contact with, he told them what they needed to do in order to have eternal life in heaven, to become a Christian and to obey the gospel. He says, I'm innocent of the blood of men. But look at this right here in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 10 and 11. He says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now notice verse 11. He says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, and we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. Are we out here persuading men? Are we out here persuading women, boys, and girls? We're on borrowed time, aren't we? We're on limited time. One day the Lord is going to come back, so this should furnish a stimulus and a theme for what? evangelism. Thirdly, it helps one to answer inquiries and to quiet deceivers. There's a lot of deceivers that are out there today just as there were in the first century when Jesus walked along the face of the earth and even after the kingdom was started. John talked about that and Peter did, uh, does too. Uh, look at 1 Peter 3.15. 1 Peter 3, 15. He says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks a reason for the hope that you have with meekness and fear. Somebody asks you, Are you going to go to heaven? What should your answer be? Yeah. Yes. Well, how
how do you know? And then you tell them that you serve the risen Savior Jesus Christ, that you have obeyed the gospel, you have remained faithful to him, and you show them through the scriptures. Because people are going to be asking questions. And I'm going to tell you this, and I may have told you this when I first came, I can't remember. No, I probably told you in the revival. If you had asked me when I first went to Pinecrest 30, almost 33 years ago why I believed what I believed, I would have told you this. Number one, because my parents told me. Number two, because the preacher preached it. Number three, because they taught at Bible college. <clears throat> Those have been the three things I would have told you if you'd asked me why I believe what I believe. But it wasn't until I was sitting in class at Milligan that I realized that wasn't good enough. Because I had some professors that were not really teaching the scripture. I even had a person on staff that I went to that his comment was, why cut the workforce in half? Why not let women be preachers? And then the professor was talking about women being deacons and women being elders in the church. Well, I had to go back and dig and research and stand and defend against what he was saying. And it really made me think, Randall, why do you believe what you believe? I couldn't say anymore because mom and dad told me. I couldn't say anymore because the preacher told me or because the school told me. I had to go book, chapter, and verse. That's why sometimes and I'm very adamant about some things, about doctrine within the scripture, because I have read and I have studied the same way that you have read and you have studied on various doctrines and things that you stand for, that this congregation stands for, that you believe with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Why? Because the word of God says it in black and white, says it in red and white, as Jesus is talking. And we'll see some things that Jesus tells us about the intermediate state of the soul. And we'll see that in weeks to come. So it helps us to answer inquiries and to quiet deceivers. We're on number four now. It helps to stimulate prayer. The importance of prayer to the Christian can never be overemphasized. And you might want to put down there Luke 18, 1 through 8. Luke 18, 1 through 8. And then I'll also look at 1 Peter 4, 7. It says, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your what? In your prayers. In your prayers. Pray for those that are lost and unsaved. Pray for opportunities for you to talk to them and to share your faith. Number five, it can strengthen love for one another. 1 Peter 4, 7 through 10. And we've already read verse 7. It says, verse 8, above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable, hospitable to one another without grumbling, as each one has received a gift, ministry to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Then number six, it can cause more glory to be given to God. More glory to be given to God. And I wrote down here Romans uh, 2, 4. So if you want to write that down under uh, number six, Romans 2, 4. And this is what Romans 2, 4 says. It says, or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Aren't you thankful for the goodness of God tonight? 